someday, and that day may never come. I may call upon you to join my Patreon. Until that day, accept this as a gift. I believe in America. The land of the free, home of the brave, and the stupid, and the criminally insane. The United States has seen its fair share of gangsters, mobsters, and psychotics who've roamed our beloved streets causing untold chaos, destruction, and corruption. Tonight on A Criminal History, the story of a gangster godfather. Tragedy, betrayal, and above all, family. Tonight, we follow the story of a man who rose from arguably humble origins into one of the most powerful monsters New York City had ever seen. We will follow a boy from the Bowery as he is drawn into an alluring life of organized crime through his desire for power and respect and his need to avenge his father and take care of his mother. We will see murderous plots, young love cut short, and tragic irony as we document the known criminal history of New York's own Aldo Trapani. Criminal History brought to you by my incredible supporters on Patreon, and a special thank you to my executive producer tier patrons, Visceral, Ezra Hambrick, and Mason Collin. If you want to support the channel, one of the best ways you can do it is by joining the Patreon and supporting those who support me. All patrons at all tiers receive access to all perks listed on the screen for only $2 Canadian a month, or less than $2 American a month. But for those extra generous few who decide to pledge at the executive producer tier level, you can also promote your own content. Today's episode is sponsored in part by executive producers Ezra Hambrick and Mason Collin. You can check out Ezra's YouTube channel, Scott Games 99 where they play games like Red Dead Redemption 2, MLB The Show 22, Vice City Definitive Edition, and more. As well as Mason Collin's podcast channel, We Are About Everything, where they discuss, well, everything, from zombie apocalypses to game remasters and more. Support the show by showing them some love, and without further ado, enjoy today's episode. Our story tonight begins in, quite appropriately, Hell's Kitchen in the Roaring Twenties. In 1924, aspiring Corleone soldier Johnny Trapani and his wife Serafina Trapani would have their presumably first child, Aldo, and raise him in the chaotic neighborhood for several years. Eventually, the Trapanis would move to Little Italy, and Aldo would be raised amongst the Corleone men who controlled the streets at the time, in and around the family's bakery, appropriately named Trapani's Bakery. By age 12, Aldo would be a rambunctious and active young man, and already be developing an understanding and a respect for his father's business, being at least familiar with the already legendary Don of the Corleone family, Don Vito Corleone, and knowing that his family's living did not primarily come from the family's bakery. Though aware to some extent of his father's real work for the Corleones, what he could not have known was that he had an active role in sabotaging a number of business fronts for the rival Barzini crime family, and as a result, had been marked for death by the Barzini Don, Don Emilio, by 1936. Where's my boy? Mm. He's been playing handball in the alley all day. I thought the noise was going to drive me nuts. My sister's looking after him tonight, though. Good. Oh my god. My boy! Oh Christ. Oh. 
Sorry, Johnny. It's just business. Give it to him. Aldo would witness his father's bakery bombed, and his own father gunned down just meters away from him on top of seeing his father's killer, Don Emilio, depart the scene without a shred of remorse. The incident would also be personally witnessed by Corleone capo Peter Clemenza, as well as, of course, Aldo's mother, Serafina, and even Don Corleone himself. Though Don Corleone would make no direct effort to influence Johnny's son to follow in his father's footsteps, he would feel obligated enough to Johnny's widow, Aldo's mother, Serafina, to provide her and her son with a comfortable living at no expense to themselves for many years. But eventually, Aldo, just like his father, would find himself in a lot more trouble than he was prepared to handle alone. Serafina, it's been too long since you've come around. What's troubling you? Godfather, my husband was always loyal to you. He died for that loyalty. I have not forgotten him, nor the loss that you have suffered. Have you ever wanted for anything? Haven't I always taken good care of you? Padrino, forgive me. It's only that I'm so worried about my son. He's fallen in with some bad men. Fools. He's in trouble and... Please. He needs your help. Godfather. I hope that their first child be a masculine child. Thank you, Luca. My most valued friend. Don Colio, I'm going to leave you now because I know that you are busy. Thank you. One more thing, my friend. I need you to find someone for me. At some point in his youth, Aldo would become involved in crime gangs much like his father, but at least starting out at a much lower level. He would, by age 21, be running with a small group of criminals known only as the Bowery Boys, and participate in several small-time robberies with them, primarily serving as a getaway driver. On one particular night after pulling off yet another successful robbery, Aldo would demand fair payment for his services in driving the getaway car, and as a result, he would be attacked and beaten by the remaining three members on orders from the leader. With his mother already worried about his involvement with the Bowery Boys, however, she would use what little influence she still had through Aldo's late father to involve the Corleone family, and quite promptly, they would send one of their most trusted enforcers to help Aldo, Luca Brazzi. Don't you deserve to cut the loot, huh? Just because you drove the fucking car? I'm the leader of this gang, and you get what I say you get. Ugh! Stay down, punk! <laughs> Check his pockets. My name is Luca Barazzi. I've been looking for you. With Luca's help, Aldo would learn the usefulness and even necessity of extreme violence in his particular profession. 
he would be cautiously brought on board to help the Corleones regain control of the various businesses around Little Italy primarily, and to that aim, Luca would also instruct Aldo on how to extort and intimidate business owners. Aldo would help Luca, and by extension the Corleones, by first shaking down Emilio's butcher shop for protection money, and in addition to taking control of the business, muscle the Corleones into the shop's upstairs racket, an illegal casino operation. However, Aldo would quickly learn that in order for the Corleones to operate such a ruthless business without constantly encountering more resistance than they could hope to counter, they would have to pay tribute to many corrupt police officers and sergeants in order to keep the peace on the streets. Hey kid, let's take a walk. Ah, it's less crowded now. I like that. Makes it easier for a man to get his business done. I make good money, I help the family, I get a little action on the side. But one thing must be understood. I would never go against the Godfather. <gasps> Don Corleone is a man I respect. Old Emilio. He doesn't seem to give a damn about paying us respect. He's giving his kickbacks to the Tatalias. Needs to be taught a lesson. But unsurprisingly, Aldo would take to the duties of a Corleone foot soldier quite naturally, and prove his natural aptitude to Luca enough to be given further responsibilities with other family associates. One of the first jobs Aldo would be given after securing Emilio's butcher shop would be under Soldado Polly Gatto, alongside trusted Corleone ally Martin Monk Malone. I'm looking for Polly Gatto. Luca. Luca sends his love. So, you Luca's new errand boy? I ain't nobody's errand boy. Hey, take a joke, why don't you? Take it easy, take it easy. Look, Luca told us about you. He's just, uh... Busting your balls, Paulie. Right, Paulie? Thinks he's a comedian. Meet Marty Malone. He ain't a pretty sight, but... My uh... friends call me Monk. Pleased to meet you. Likewise. Okay, okay, this ain't no tea party. We got work to do. Now follow me. It's right around the corner. With Don Vito's daughter Connie having recently married, the Godfather had been under obligation to agree to help just about anybody with sufficient connections to his family, and one of the vows he would make would be to avenge the Undertaker, Bonacera, whose daughter had been viciously attacked. Working with Monk and Polly, Aldo would find the punks responsible for roughing up Maria Bonacera and proceed to brutally beat them into submission, and leave them badly bruised, but still alive, once again impressing his new allies, and especially Monk Malone. Maybe he can use some company. Please, I won't do it again. Oh, we know you ain't gonna do it again. Jeez, you should have learned to treat the games a little nicer, with a little respect. Now it's too late. Good night, sweetheart. Come on, that's enough. For Aldo, there was almost no better time to be informally invited to be a part of the Corleone family, as in the organized crime business, one man's loss really was another's gain. Aldo would become trusted enough in his short time serving under Luca Brazzi to be asked personally by Luca to accompany him to a meeting with an up-and-coming drug runner by the name of Virgil Salazzo, and the son of Don Philip Tatalia, Bruno, longtime enemies of the Corleone family in Little Italy and Brooklyn. Luca's job would be to act as though he'd become dissatisfied with the Corleone family and see exactly what Salazzo and the Tatalias were offering to defectors. But Aldo would also soon learn that even a feared and respected man like Luca would not be immune to a well-timed garret wire. There's an alley over there where you can keep an eye on the meeting. Now, if anything happens, Get out of there fast and find Monk. Io ho capito che non sei contento più con la famiglia Corleone. Capace che vuoi cambiare? Ti vuoi mettere con me? Pars des ordres sonne bon. 
50 mil dólares de la principia. Va a vale. De acuerdo. Va bien. Gracias. Witnessing the death of Luca Brazzi at the hands of Solozzo and Bruno Tattaglia, Aldo would kill several of the assassins and then flee the scene to return to his Corleone-provided safe house and gather his thoughts. As he'd been instructed by Luca before his death, he would immediately phone Monk Malone and make him aware that something had gone horribly wrong. But being a seasoned professional of the business, Monk would know better than to discuss such matters on the phone and instead agreed to meet Aldo at Di Montagna's barber shop in Little Italy that afternoon. Aldo would meet with Monk at the barber shop in the heart of Little Italy, and just as he managed to spill the beans regarding Luca's assassination, a much higher profile hit would be taking place right outside. In response to Don Corleone's refusal to deal with Salazzo's rising drug rackets, Salazzo and Tattaglia would plot the death of Don Vito himself, and hire two soldiers to ambush the Godfather as he was doing his shopping, escorted by his eldest son, Fredo. It's a work day. Keep your mind on the job. Hey, Francis! Marty! Over here! Hey, sis. How you doing? How's the old man? Good. Most days, he's tired. Aspetta, Fredo. I'm gonna buy some fruit. Okay, Bob. Not a chance. What's up? Monk! Thank God. Luca's dead. Luca? Thank you very much. You're very kind. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Call in the ambulance, Monk. No. You'll be all right. Frankie, my sister, she's out there. Make sure she's okay. Are you okay? Uh, yeah, I think so. I've met worse than him. You're Frankie, right? Monk's sister. Yeah, why? He's been shot. Oh, God. What happened? It was a hit. I think the Don is dead. The assassins would shoot the Don several times at near point-blank range, and in the chaos, Aldo would be forced to gun several of them down when Monk takes a stray bullet and be asked to save Monk's sister, Frankie, also caught in the midst of the chaos. After saving Frankie and eliminating the attackers, Aldo would be approached by Fredo Corleone and asked to escort Don Vito to the hospital and Aldo, already having considerable experience as a getaway driver, would gladly oblige. After an intense chase across the river and back again, Aldo would be personally forced to drive the Don's ambulance, along with Fredo, and deliver the dying Don to the hospital, where he was greeted by yet another of Vito's sons, Santino Corleone. We need some help here. Let's get some help over here. Hey, Fred. Get some help. What the hell happened? Sonny, Sonny, I... I... Pop! God damn it! What's this guy watching a movie? Get him out of here! Fredo, get your ass over here. Hey, kid. Don't mind, Sonny. It's just that... Seeing his pop like that. So what happened out there? We got trapped on the bridge. Guy there says something about Salazzo and your consigliere. Consigliere? Tom, what else did he say, kid? This is important. What else? He said they were in an old diner in Brooklyn. Christ. I hope Tom is okay. He's not the fighting type. We'll take it from here, kid. Head on over to the compound.
After a less than ideal introduction to Sonny, Aldo would also meet his new boss, even if he didn't quite know it at the time, Capo Regime Peter Clemenza, whom Luca Brazzi operated under, and be reassured that his help to the Corleones in this desperate time would not go unrewarded. Before any such rewards could be conceived, however, Aldo would be recruited into helping Clemenza save Corleone Consiglieri, an adopted brother to Sonny and Fredo, Tom Hagen, who had been abducted by Solazzo shortly before Vito's assassination attempt. Aldo would next accompany Clemenza, along with Rocco Lampone, to Joe's diner in Brooklyn, where Clemenza had discovered Tom was being held, and the three men would infiltrate the building with the intention of bringing Tom home safely. Though they would manage to get Tom back, they would stop short of catching or killing Virgil Salazzo himself, who would discover the failed status of his assassination attempt just as Aldo came upon the group, ready for action. He's still alive. They hit him with five shots and he's still alive. Well, that's bad luck for me and bad luck for you. Goodbye, Tom. Sorry it didn't work out. Good job, kid. Luca's dead, Tom. Jesus. It's worse than I thought. How's the doc? It's bad. Let's get out of here. With Tom safe and the Don hurt but still alive, Aldo would finally be asked to outright join the Corleone family as an unofficial enforcer working the streets, and with that, his path would be set in stone. Let me speak plainly. The Corleone family has need of men like you, because as we speak, our enemies encircle us, waiting to prey on any sign of weakness. What can I do for the family? We would like to offer you a role as an unofficial enforcer for the family. See that we maintain control in the streets, help us to regain our true balance. In time, you will become a trusted associate to our family, and then, God willing, you will become one of our made men. Though Tom Hagen was back in good hands and the Godfather still lived, Vito had not been the only man hit that day, and as a result, Aldo would have more than one reason to continue hanging around the Little Italy Hospital, and eventually, he would once again encounter Monk Malone's sister, Frankie, and attempt to win her favor. Hi. Hi. God duty, huh? Yeah. You? I'm here to see Marty. Listen, um, thanks. There's nothing I hate more than playing the damsel in distress. But I appreciate what you did. I guess I better go in. Uh, hey. Yeah? I was thinking, maybe we should, you know. No. No. We really shouldn't. But we will. But however interested Frankie Malone was in Aldo, she was there first and foremost to check in on her brother. And unsurprisingly, Monk's association to the Corleones would mean that his life remained in jeopardy, along with the Don. While watching over Monk and Frankie, another assassin would break into the hospital and attempt to gun down Vito Corleone. But either given bad information, or making a wrong call on the room, Aldo would intercept him first, and proceed to escort a terrified Frankie to the hospital basement to escape and find Tom Hagen for a more long-term solution. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Who are you? Who are you? I'm Michael Corleone. Men are coming here tonight to kill my father. I'm here to help. Clemenza sent me. What happened to the police? The guards? I don't know, but I have an idea. I'm gonna get the nurse to move my father to another room. Now you better get your girl out of here. There's a way out through the basement. Go find Tom Hagen. Tell him what's going on. Hey, keep away from the front door. They may be out there already. In the meantime, Aldo would first meet the third and final son of Vito Corleone, who had thus far remained uninvolved in the family business, war hero Michael Corleone, and be asked personally by Michael to help safeguard the hospital and keep Vito alive while Tom and his men hurried over. Aldo would once again be introduced to the very same police sergeant he'd been forced to bribe while working under Luca Brazzi, Joe Galtasino, working under corrupt captain Mark McCluskey. But thanks to Tom's threat of illegal intervention, he would be spared any physical attacks, at least that night, though the same could not be said for Michael Corleone. 
But much like Michael Corleone, albeit a bit sooner, Aldo would be given a clear opportunity to get revenge on the corrupt sergeant, when several weeks later, following the recovery of Monk Malone, Aldo once again met the sergeant at a party atop Rosa's flower shop in Little Italy, which to the right kind of customers, was in fact, a front for a brothel. Party's over. Well, well, who do we have here? Huh? Bunch of celebrities, are we? But we'll see about that. I think I need to take you in for, uh, interrogation. Stop! Ah! Son of a bitch! Something's gotta be done. But the sergeant wouldn't be wise enough to incapacitate Trapani himself, and Aldo would take the opportunity to sneak away from Rosa's through the alley and locate Joe Galtasino on a rooftop as he tried to take advantage of the host. He was drunk. He fell. It was an accident. With Monk fully recovered and Don Vito finally on the mend, an increasingly ambitious Alda would soon after meet the Godfather himself as he recovered in the hospital, and ironically enough, agreed to help the Don in securing the cooperation of a police chief that the family expected and so desperately needed at a time when they faced increased pressure from Salazzo. Your father was a friend of mine. He had my trust. Now tell me, can I trust you to do me a favor? Of course. How can I help? I try to keep my family protected. Sometimes that means making friends with the police, with judges. I keep them in my pocket and they keep us safe. But this recent bloodshed, it's made them forget their loyalties. I need you to visit my friend, the chief. Pay him off. Remind them that we're still on the same side. He'll be at a police retirement party. You'll recognize him. He's a smoker and he's good with women. Speak with him, but do not bribe the wrong man. Upon finding and bribing the police chief, Aldo would also learn of another internal Corleone problem that could use his personal touch, when the chief sent him to meet one of his men across town. As it turned out, the eldest Corleone sibling, Fredo, had been tasked by his criminal overseer and none other than the king of Las Vegas, Mo Green, with disposing of the body of a man that Mo had business disagreements with. Exactly how Mo Green knew this man, when he was killed, or why he'd been in New York at all, remains a mystery. But what isn't a mystery is that Aldo Trapani was the one responsible for finding and destroying Fredo's car, along with all the evidence of Mo's crimes. You must be the guy the chief told me about. You fit the description. Yeah, it's me. He said Fredo might be in trouble. What's going on? We picked up a car in Jersey, traced it to Fredo. But there's something in the trunk. It's bad. Tom Hagen pays me to help you guys out, but I can't fix this myself. Can you? Don't worry, I can handle it. What's in the car? A body. One of Mo Green's old business partners. Mo off the guy and asked Fredo to get rid of the evidence. But the cops picked up the car on a parking violation first. Sneak into the station and blow up the car with dynamite. The explosion will make sure they won't be able to identify the body. A constant boon to the Corleone family and exceedingly talented at street work, soon after, Aldo would be promoted within the family to an official Corleone associate, and all in the span of just a few months. No. No, 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 no more. Not this time, Consigliere. No more meetings, no more discussions, no more Salazzo tricks. You give him one message. I want Salazzo. If not, it's all out war. We go to the mattresses, all right? Father wouldn't want to hear this. This is business, not personal, Sonny. They shot my father. 
That's business, your ass. Even the shooting of your father was business, not personal, Sonny. Well, the business will have to suffer, all right? Listen, Tom, do me a favor. There's no more advice on how to patch things up. Just, just help me try to win this thing, okay? Hey, son, we'd like you to become an associate to the Corleone family. We can use a man of your abilities representing us out on the streets. The point I want to stress to you, though, if you're going to be one of our associates, is the power of negotiation, okay? Even with the way things are now, especially in times like this, use your head. A lawyer with his briefcase can steal more than a hundred men with guns. Hey, kid, listen. Believe me, if you ever have a hundred guys with guns on your side, whatever you do, don't trade them in for some fucking lawyer. <laughs> Not everyone took their vow of loyalty to the Corleones as seriously as Aldo did, and shortly after the new year in 1946, he would be first tasked with eliminating a traitorous member of the family who had been partially responsible for Don Vito's assassination attempt, Polly Gatto. Though a made man in Clemenza's crew and otherwise well trusted, Polly had also taken up the role of being Don Vito's personal driver at the time of Salazzo's attempt on his life, and conveniently had called in sick the day of the attack, resulting in Fredo driving Vito instead. Having confirmed Polly's betrayal through Sonny, Pete Clemenza would also bring Aldo along on a planned trip to bomb The Roost, a Tatalia-controlled bar, and inform him that along the way, he would be responsible for whacking Polly Gatto. That Sonny's running wild. He's thinking of going to the mattresses already. We gotta find a spot over on the west side. You know any good spots on the west side? Yeah. I think about it. Well, think about it while you're driving, will you? Pull over here. We own this restaurant. Hey, Paulie. You heard what my wife said. Run in and get me some cannoli. So what? I'm the grocery boy now? Paulie's going down today. But there's this thing we got to clean up first. A bar around the corner that the Dahlia's got. I need you to go upstairs and pick up the weapons and the dynamite I stashed up there. Clemenza, Polly, and Aldo would first stop at the Tatalia controlled bar, and at least initially, with some stealth, break into the well-guarded establishment and plant explosives on the top floor to gut the building, and deny the Tatalias one more hiding spot outside of their native territory in Brooklyn. In the chaos, Polly would even manage to retrieve the cannoli asked for by Clemenza's wife, but helpful or not, his own number would just about be up. Who hot in there for you, Polly? What are you talking about? <laughs> I was covering you. Yeah. Ah, I knew you was good for something, Paulie. You make my wife very happy. <laughs> Pull over, will you? I gotta take a leak. Soon after, Clemenza would make a stop to supposedly relieve himself, and give Aldo the silent go-ahead to put an end to Polly. But Aldo, perhaps still mastering the art of subtlety, would inadvertently show his hand when loading his pistol in the car, and be forced to chase Polly, at least briefly, before gunning him down. Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. Christ. Waco! 
I asked you to bring us a car, not the entire fucking police force. They picked me up on the bridge. I couldn't shake them. Christ. Let's get out of here. Kid, you drive. But killing Poligata would not be the only move that Aldo would make in retaliation to Salazzo and the Tatalias trying to muscle the Corleones out of Little Italy. And not long after Polly's death, Clemenza would recruit his help in taking down a Tatalia warehouse, moving Salazzo's goods, by stealing one of the warehouse's trucks and performing a Trojan horse maneuver to get multiple well-armed Corleone soldiers inside. After the successful takeover, Aldo would even find and destroy numerous underground drug fronts being run by Salazzo to further cripple the narcotics dealer in his efforts to make New York a new market, though unsurprisingly, this would only slow, and not stop, the flow of heavy drugs into the city. By 1948, Aldo was operating as a well-known and well-respected associate for the Corleone family, but his next major assignment for the family beyond his normal extortion rackets would involve, of all things, a trip to Los Angeles, California. When the Godfather's godson and world-famous singer Johnny Fontaine is rejected for a career-making role in an upcoming film by a movie producer, Jack Waltz, Tom Hagen would fly to L.A. along with Rocco Lampone and Aldo to convince Waltz that cooperation would be in his own best interest. <laughs> You don't understand. Johnny Fontaine never gets that move. And I'm gonna run him out of the business. And let me tell you why. She was beautiful. She was young. She was innocent. She was the greatest piece of ass I ever had. And I've had him all over the world. She threw it all away to make me look ridiculous. Now you get the hell out of here. And if that Goomba tries any rough stuff, you tell him I ain't no band leader. Yeah. I heard that story. Thank you for dinner and a very pleasant evening. If your car could take me to the airport, Mr. Corleone is a man who insists on hearing bad news immediately. Though Tom Hagen would attempt negotiation to get Johnny Fontaine his movie role, he would quickly discover that Waltz's reasons for rejecting Fontaine were not entirely professional, and instead very, very personal. With Don Vito's generous offer rudely refused by the movie producer, Tom Hagen would ostensibly leave to give the Godfather the bad news back in New York, but in reality, he would silently let Rocco and Aldo know that it was their time to shine. Being obsessed with one of his horses, Khartoum, possibly a reference to its geographic origin, Waltz would keep a stable on his property to maintain and prepare his candidates for racing day. Knowing that his sentimentality was his greatest weakness, Rocco and Aldo would sneak into the stable, find Khartoum, and proceed to decapitate the animal by unknown means, but we assume quickly, as it would be done without arousing the suspicion of any other guards in the area. Horse head in hand, Rocco and Aldo would sneak their way through the Waltz estate and plant the animal's severed head in his bed, under his blankets no less, ensuring that Waltz awoke to a very shocking and frightening scene, and ensuring that he knew not to refuse an offer from the Godfather. But Waltz's comeuppance would be small potatoes for a man like Aldo Trapani, who had already, by that point, become quite accustomed to violence and brutality on his criminal career path, and knew more bloodshed was sure to come. By this time in 1948, Aldo had begun to see Frankie Malone in his rare off time, and the two would gradually develop a loving relationship together, supported by Aldo's criminal lifestyle. That year, the Corleone family would even purchase an apartment in Midtown for the two, and at least for a brief moment, their future life together would seem prosperous and hopeful, but life in the Mafia rarely comes without caveats. With the threat of Salazzo seemingly unresolvable by diplomatic means, the Corleone family's next move would be to come out swinging with a suggestion from the otherwise uninvolved sibling up to that point, Michael Corleone. Using Michael's assumed neutrality, or at the very least, lack of history committing violence for the Corleones themselves, he would arrange a meeting with the corrupt police captain Mark McCluskey and Virgil Salazzo himself to discuss peace terms at a restaurant in Little Italy, Louis. Nay, I want somebody good, and I'm talking very good to plant that gut. I don't want my brother walking out of that toilet with just his dick in his hands, all right? The gun will be there.
Hold it where it's taped. I need you to take this over to Louis' restaurant and hide it behind the toilet. You can count on me. Good, good. Now get going. You ain't got much time. Under orders from Clemenza, Aldo would sneak into Louis' restaurant before the planned meeting between Michael and Salazzo and plant a 38 snub nosed revolver behind one of the toilets for easy retrieval by Mike. Just as planned, partway through the dinner between Mike, McCluskey, and Salazzo, Michael would excuse himself to the washroom and take the pistol Aldo had left for him to put two holes into both the corrupt police captain and finally, Salazzo himself. Haphazardly fleeing the scene and dropping the gun as he'd been instructed to do by Clemenza, Michael would flee Louis' restaurant with Aldo's help, and following a short pursuit by Tatalia forces, arrive at the docks in Hell's Kitchen, where Mike planned to leave America, and live in Italy for several years, in order to let the heat of his actions die down for the family. No more attempts on my father's life. What guarantees could I give you, Mike? I am the hunted one. I missed my chance. You'll think too much of me, kid. I'm not that clever. All I want is a truce. I have to go to the bathroom. Is that all right? You gotta go, you gotta go. I frisked him. He's clean. Don't take too long. for a while, so, so keep your head down. And, uh, thanks. You're safe. I won't forget it. You can count on that. Sonny will help you out until I return. With Michael fleeing to live in Italy, and Fredo too incompetent to run the family in Don Vito's absence, Santino Sonny Corleone would take de facto control of the family operations during this time. Though still taking a backseat to outright controlling the family, Don Vito would allow Sonny to wage his arguably ineffective war against the Tatalias, which was slowly bleeding over into the other five families of New York, and in pursuit of his victory, end up bringing tragedy and misery to his most trusted soldiers. But if Aldo was going to continue to be one of the Corleone's most effective tools of the trade in their escalating war, he would first need to be given a truly official and respectable position within the family ranks. And around this time, Don Vito would agree to do just that. In 1948, Aldo would finally be given the position of soldado, or soldier, within the Corleone family, and thus become one of their made men, who would continue Sonny's war with the full endorsement of the family behind him. There is nothing more important to a man than his family. These men, these men of honor, they too are my family. La familia Corleone. I now invite you to be reborn as one of us. Yes, Godfather. You are now one of our qualified men. You owe me me qualification. Please, introduce yourself to your brother. Hey, Hatcha. Congratulations. Good for you, kid. You're done. Glad you're on our side. Becoming a made man should have been one of the most important moments in Aldo's career. But given his role up to that point in personally taking down numerous fronts and interests controlled by the other families, he himself would become a target for retribution, and thus, so would Frankie. 
One afternoon, while preparing to spend time together at their midtown apartment, Aldo and Frankie would be ambushed by a group of Tatalia hitmen, and in spite of Aldo's best attempts to keep Frankie safe, she would be kidnapped by the monsters, and taken from the apartment. Aldo would fight his way through the attacking Tatalia soldiers, and eventually locate one of their capos in charge of the ambush, and beat the location Frankie had been taken to out of him, before executing the capo himself. Hey, Hotshot. Glad you could make it. Hmm. Christ! You're after me! Get out of here! Immediately phoning Monk Malone to inform him of Frankie's kidnapping, Aldo would proceed to meet with Monk in Little Italy, and take him to St. Michael's Church in Brooklyn, where she was being held. But a terrified monk would blame Aldo for getting involved with Frankie in the first place. There were too many of them. I lost her. We'll get her back, monk. Come on. She's not part of this, for God's sake. She'll make it. They would race to the church and fight through even more Tatalia soldiers, but arrive just moments too late to save Frankie, who had presumably already been shot, and was mere moments away from death. Ah, there you are. Frankie! Oh, God. Where were you? I got you now, honey. Why didn't you come? Don't let go. With Frankie Malone's death, Aldo would lose a lover and a friend in Monk Malone though he may not have fully realized it at the time. Furious, and prepared to exact his own revenge on the Tatalias, Aldo would soon after meet with Santino Corleone at Stromboli's supplies, and Sonny would give his new soldier an opportunity to release some of his anger by capturing and torturing a Tatalia capo together in the back of the warehouse, ostensibly to learn where Bruno Tatalia was hiding. But in reality, the capo was merely another sacrificial pawn in Sonny's war, and Aldo was only too happy to oblige his boss. <laughs> Hey, that's enough, kid. We can't dance around here all night. We're done. Let's get you cleaned up. Okay? Come on. Listen, I really gotta thank you. You know, for being so cooperative with us. I die before I speak. I have said nothing. No, 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 my friend. You've been very helpful. You're my key in the door. What? What key? I told you nothing. The Tatayas are gonna cremate that son of a bitch at their funeral. Bruno will be there. After beating the capo in an attempt to supposedly learn about where Bruno was hiding out, Sonny and Aldo would lie to him and leave him with the impression that he would actually walk out of the building alive, just before Sonny kicked him out of a door in the side of the building, leading directly into the concrete. With the capo dead, Sonny knew the Tatalia family would be prepared to hold a funeral for him, and that Bruno would almost certainly be in attendance, and thus, the plan was set. Aldo would race to the funeral parlor of Tito Morelli and proceed to violently shoot his way through the building until finding Bruno and his guards on the upper floors, and engaging them for his revenge. Though Bruno would attempt to have Aldo himself killed, and would even personally fight back against the Corleone soldier, eventually, Aldo would kill Bruno's guard and capo, Massimo, and finally, Bruno himself, chucking the heartless Tatalia underboss into the funeral parlor's cremation oven, and avenging his murdered girlfriend. 
With Bruno Tattaglia dead, and tensions between the Corleones and the other four families of New York still on the rise, Aldo would next learn a lesson of subtlety from Don Vito himself. When he was asked to break up a strike at Verona Warehouse, which he had taken control of for the Corleones from the Tattaglias. Vito, being far more relaxed and calm in his thinking than his son Santino, would ask Aldo to break up the strike with minimal violence, but Aldo, knowing little else besides violence, would end up raining chaos on the protesting workers in order to get what he wanted. And as a result, he would also bring further turmoil down on his capo, Peter Clemenza, when the police overheard of Aldo's less than subtle shakedown. If it isn't Mr. I can't break up a protest without the whole fucking world finding out. Clemenza, come on, why the grief? I'll tell you why. You cracked some skulls at the protest, so the cops decide to crack down on me. Real fucking fair. I think you owe me one, right? Of course. Sorry. What do you need? These guys here tip me off. The cops are on their way to raid my house. Anything I don't want them to find is on that truck. I need you to drive the truck to Paulie's old safe house. Don't let the cops get you. There's shit in there that could get us all busted. Aldo would indeed manage to take the truck containing all of the things Clemenza didn't want the police to find at his house and stash it at Polly's old safe house in Brooklyn to keep away from the authorities. But even with his success, troubles for the family would be far from over. That year, in 1948, an attack on the Corleone compound would be staged by the Cuneo crime family. And though Aldo and his fellow soldiers would manage to defend it, the Corleones would also lose two high-ranking members in a drive-by shooting by the Cuneos around the same time. And it seemed that all roads led to even more conflict. Now come on, Sonny. We gotta ease up. Negotiate. You see? There. You see? That's where this Irish crap comes out in you. You know, ease up, take it easy shit. I mean, no disrespect, Tom, but... An Italian consigliere would only listen to this negotiation shit if he had a sharp knife held on this guy's throat. Sonny, you're my brother, but sometimes... Oh, Christ, Tom, I'm, I'm sorry. Look, you, you know you're my brother ever since the day I bought you home. But let's face facts here. There's killing to be done. Aldo would meet with Sonny at his mistress Lucy Mancini's apartment in Midtown and fill him in on the next phase of his plan which Sonny had been highly encouraged by Corleone consigliere Tom Hagen to abandon. Sonny would order Aldo to drive him to Caruso in Hell's Kitchen, and the Don would then personally storm the business alongside Trapani, and kill dozens of Cuneo foot soldiers in order to locate a Cuneo racket boss on the second floor. However, the racket boss would flee Caruso's, forcing Sonny and Aldo to pursue him all the way to the city's rail yard, and once again, they would shoot their way through dozens of hostile gangsters in order to reach the racket boss, whose fate Sonny left entirely in Aldo's hands. Wait. I'm a businessman, is all. I don't want no more trouble. You should have thought of that before you set your goons on us. I'll tell you what you want to know. We, we get supply from Midtown. Midtown, they're in charge. Who's in charge here? You got General Patton selling your tanks? What? You're not far wrong. Guns. Lots of guns. Hell's Kitchen, an old wharf. Holy hallelujah. Christmas. There's more. Artie Manzarano. He's your pope down there. Whoa, look at this. Big time Artie to Moose Manzarano. Hey, that's bingo for us, fellas. Didn't you always pulling some Cuneo strings? So now you let me go, huh? It's business. Only business. Oh, sure, sure. You're absolutely right. Time to get out of the business, my friend. Please. Please. I have children. Little children. Everybody loses something. Through the boss, Sonny and Aldo would learn that the real target would be Cuneo Capo Artie the Moose Manzarano and their next move would be to locate and intimidate Manzarano at the Westport Warehouse. With Aldo and Sonny's considerable rage and skills with firearms, the two men would, completely on their own, take control of the warehouse by first shooting their way through the defending Cuneo soldiers. Upon locating Artie themselves, Aldo would manage to convince him to turn over all interests in the warehouse to the Corleone family, and at least from Sonny's perspective, it would be a welcome victory in the developing war of the five families. Sonny's next move would be to rob a bank which he knew was laundering Cuneo money, but an unforeseen change of plans would ultimately cause the bank job to be scrapped indefinitely. Upon learning from Salvatore Tessio that his sister Connie Corleone was being beaten by her new husband and Sonny's former friend Carlo Rizzi, Sonny would race out of the compound to confront Rizzi, and Aldo would follow behind him just in case things went south, which unfortunately for Sonny, they certainly did. 
me I got a good one for you. Geez, I, I sure hope he wasn't planning a vacation today. I'm all he is. Going to your bank up in the Bronx handles all that dirty laundry. So we're going to walk right in, and I'm going to take whatever the hell we like. Sonny. Fuck him. It's for you. Bink, you don't know. I'll be right back. Hang on. Upon reaching the toll booth at Jones Beach Causeway, Sonny would be ambushed by members of all four rival families to the Corleones, and thanks to a paid-off toll booth attendant, meet his tragic end in a hail of gunfire. Son of a bitch. Come on! Come on! Aldo would arrive shortly after Sonny's murder and proceed to chase down the assassins and the fleeing toll booth attendant who'd set Sonny up in order to get answers for who called the hit. Aldo would indeed corner and intimidate the attendant and through him learn that the order to kill Sonny had come from the Barzini crime family out of Midtown, which he would disclose to Tom Hagen at the Corleone compound just as Don Vito himself learned of his son's death. My wife is crying upstairs. I hear cars coming to the house. The Sigliere of mine, I think you should tell your Don what everyone seems to know. They shot Sonny on the causeway. He's dead. I want all inquiries made. I want no acts of vengeance. I want you to arrange a meeting with the heads of the five families. This war stops now. I must have a strict assurance from Corleone. As time goes by and his position becomes stronger, will he attempt any individual vendetta? Look, we are all reasonable men here. We don't have to give assurances as if we were lawyers. I'm willing to do whatever's necessary to find a peaceful solution to these problems. But I have selfish reasons. My youngest son was forced to leave this country because of his salazzo business. All right. And I have to make arrangements to bring him back here safely, cleared of all these false charges. But I'm a superstitious man. And if some unlucky accident should befall him, then I'm going to blame some of the people in this room. And that I do not forgive. But that aside, let me say that I swear on the souls of my grandchildren that I will not be the one to break the peace that we have made here today. Following Sonny's death, Don Vito would negotiate a tenuous peace between the five families and work to have his exiled son Michael return to New York without being attacked or harassed. Upon Michael's return, he would finally give up his attempts to remain outside of the family business entirely and embrace the role his father had envisioned for him by becoming acting head of the Corleone family, with Don Vito serving as his consigliere in the twilight of his life. One of Michael's first acts as the new Don Corleone would be to promote Aldo, under advisement from his father, to Capo Regime, and give him even more freedom in his operations as one of the most effective tools in the Corleone arsenal. My friend, 
We've given you a good living, a lot of freedom, and now it is time to offer you more. My father has suggested, and I have agreed. From today, I wish you to stand at my right hand as my capo regime, Godfather. But not a word of this to anyone else. Tom is out as consigliere. And Clemenza is to be given his own family. And other things are changing. We must move with the times until we become unchallengeable. By 1950, with Michael assuming control of the family, he would begin his due diligence in finding out exactly where the family stood after Sonny's devastating war, and in the process, discover that somebody within the family was an informant to the FBI, though he wasn't initially sure who. Suspecting either Aldo himself or longtime Corleone associate and friend to Trapani, Marty Monk Malone, Michael would send Aldo to meet Malone and supposedly find the FBI informants at the Bowery Hotel in Little Italy. Monk would inform Aldo that Michael had personally assured him that the FBI rat was holed up in the hotel, but in reality, after the two men shot their way through several Barzini soldiers guarding the Fed, Monk would inadvertently reveal that it had been him informing on the Corleones all along, at least since the death of his sister Frankie. What the fuck are you doing? We had a deal, Luo! You stinking traitor rat! <laughs> Jesus Christ, Monk. Who is this guy? He's the snitch. He's the one. Monk. Put your guns down. Both of you. Jimmy? What the fuck are you doing here? Michael sent me. To help you guys out. What are you fucking kidding me? We don't need no babysitter, Jimmy. This was our job. Oh yeah? Who pulled the trigger? Come on, Jimmy. This ain't no quiz show. What's done is done, alright? So who killed the agent? Was it you? Nah, it, it was Monk. What do you mean, agent? I thought this guy was an informant. He's a fed. Michael, yeah. Yeah, it's me. I'm here. You were right. It was Malone. There was a dead FBI agent here. Yeah. Yeah, he pulled the trigger. He's here. Hold on. It's Michael. He wants to talk to you. Michael, what the hell is going on? Monk's dirty. He just killed the agent that was running him. He was desperate to cover his tracks because we were smoking him out. So, what? You played some kind of game with me to set up Monk? I was the bait? No, a suspect. We had to be sure. Now it's settled. But uh, you'll have to kill him. For the family. With Aldo cleared of any suspicion, but Monk's new allegiances revealed, Michael would personally order Aldo to track down and kill Malone, despite his reservations with killing a former friend. Knowing exactly where his loyalties were, Aldo would agree, and locate Malone at a nightclub, the Va Va Voom Room, in Little Italy with help from Corleone soldier Jimmy Denunzio, who had been following Aldo and Monk under Michael's orders. When you killed Frankie, when they killed Frankie, I just didn't care anymore. But you turned your back on the family. You're gonna let me go, or you're gonna die trying to stop me, so help me. Though Aldo would attempt to convince his friend to stand down, both men would know that their encounter could only end one way and a subsequent shootout would erupt inside the nightclub, with Aldo taking down numerous Cuneo soldiers who had been working with Monk to betray the Corleones. After disposing of the Cuneo soldiers guarding him, Aldo Trapani would personally execute his former friend Marty Malone on the nightclub stage, with barely a hint of remorse remaining in his jaded heart. Over the course of the next five years, Aldo Trapani would use his new position as a Corleone Capo regime to slowly take control of numerous fronts and rackets across New York City, and gradually be given more and more freedom to operate as a capo for the family. In 1952, he would even be given permission to form his own crime family alongside Corleone Capo's Salvatore Tessio and his old boss Peter Clemenza, 
and those still operating entirely under the Corleone umbrella, began expanding his family's ranks to ensure its stability. One of his first recruits into the newly formed Trapani crime family would be his nephew, Dominic Barbaro, whose skills boosting cars and fist fighting had by then already impressed Aldo. But it isn't entirely clear who Dominic's father or mother had been, given that nothing is known about the other Trapani siblings. In July of 1955, the legendary founder of the Corleone family, Don Vito himself, would finally succumb to the hazards of old age, and die of a heart attack at age 68 at the family compound. Though the Corleones had been regaining much of their former power in both Little Italy and the rest of the city, the war between them and the remaining four families had seemingly never truly come to an end, as they continued to chip away at Corleone interests, particularly the Barzini family of Midtown. This was especially true following the death of Don Vito, whose tenuous peace effectively evaporated with his passing, leaving the Corleones the number one target for the other families of New York. The Barzinis would get so close to toppling Michael's growing empire that they would even manage to convince Corleone capo Salvatore Tessio to betray Michael and set him up for a hit. But Michael would know of this betrayal thanks to advice from his late father, and subsequently set Tessio up for his own comeuppance. Before Tessio's plans could be carried out, Michael would pull the rug out from under him, and send Aldo along with Corleone soldier Willie Cicci to ambush the ambushers at the Embassy Club where Tessio had intended for Michael to be killed. Sending Tessio in first and expecting he would be caught in the crossfire, Aldo and Cicci would storm the club and gun down several Barzini assassins, but in the process, Tessio would manage to nearly escape. Aldo would track him down, cornering him inside the club, and despite Tessio's pleas to be forgiven, he would be gunned down by the new Corleone capo, and his businesses would, as a result, fall under Aldo's control as a capo instead. Though we've neglected to mention it thus far, Tessio had pleaded with Aldo to spare him not only because of their joint affiliation to the Corleone family, but because of their own history, with Aldo taking on several assassination contracts issued by Tessio over the years in and around New York. In fact, Aldo would work for various high-ranking members of the Corleone family carrying out hits against whatever targets he was instructed to, from the likes of Salvatore Tessio, Peter Clemenza, Al Neri, and Anthony the Trojan Grinelli between 1945 and 1955. With Tessio's death and yet another Barzini plot foiled, Michael's plans for New York and the Corleone family would slowly come to fruition, but before he could fully consolidate his power, he would have one more major task to carry out that would also require Aldo's considerable talents as a button man. Hey, it's you! Hey, come on in, welcome! Long time no see, Pally. Hello, Fredo. How you been? Good. Great! So, you here to sample the good life? I mean, what can I get you? Nah, I'm here to meet Mike. Michael? Michael, what is, what does he want? Mikey, you look good. What brings you here? Fredo, sit down. Hear me out. Sure, Mike. But what is it? What's going on? We're taking down the hotel, Fredo. Tonight. But... Now. But why? This is Moe's operation. He, he's my friend, Mikey. Moe's dirty, Fredo. You know he refused my offer. I can't allow that to happen. Uh, God damn it. This can't be right. Now, I need you to do something for me. Just name it. There's a secret casino in the basement. You're gonna clean it up. It's members only, so get the password from one of the hotel workers. I got it. Good. I won't let you down. I don't expect you will. With plans to move the Corleone family's interest to Las Vegas shortly after his takeover of New York, Michael would instruct Aldo to rob a secret casino owned and controlled by Mo Green, and confirm that his next move would be to eliminate Green entirely. Arranging for Green to have a private massage at Orchid Inc. in Midtown, Aldo would ambush the King of Las Vegas and put a bullet in his eye, before returning to Clemenza at Cochran's Perch to learn the next and final stage of Michael's elaborate plan. Did you take care of our little problem? Yeah. Mo's going back to Vegas in a pine box. Good. Here's your share from the heist. Now, when you're ready, meet Michael in Little Italy. He's gonna be at the baptism for Connie's baby. A baptism? What's he need me there for? It's business. Michael's gonna put an end to all this bloodshed once and for all. He'll tell you more at the church, okay? 
With Green dead, the next targets would be none other than the remaining heads of the five families, which meant that Aldo would finally, after 20 years, be given the opportunity for revenge against Don Emilio Barzini that he'd been promised by Don Vito when he was 12 years old. Aldo would meet with Michael on the morning of his nephew's baptism at a church in Little Italy, and be instructed to next meet with Clemenza at a midtown flower shop in order to begin Michael's process of winning the War of the Five Families once and for all, with a total and complete Corleone family victory. It's our destiny. I know you won't fail. Aldo would meet with Clemenza and learn of their first target, Don Victor Stracci of New Jersey, who was expecting to be escorted personally by Aldo to a peace negotiation with Michael, which in reality would not go how the Don anticipated. Aldo and Clemenza would meet Don Stracci and his men at the St. Albans Hotel in Midtown, and Aldo would personally meet with the Don to walk him to the elevator. Upon exiting the elevator on the ground floor, however, Don Stracci would be greeted not by his men, but by Clemenza wielding a shotgun, who proceeded to gun down the Don in cold blood. It is conceivable that Aldo himself was the one to kill Stracci either in the elevator or beforehand, but what isn't disputed is that the two Corleone capos would leave the hotel with their first hit, a success, and Aldo would next meet up with Willie Cicci at a barber shop in Hell's Kitchen. Let's go. Drive to the Savannah Hotel. Who are we gunning for? We're gonna take down Cuneo. Should be a piece of cake. Willie and Aldo would proceed to assault the Savannah Hotel in Midtown where Don Carmine Cuneo was held up, surrounded by numerous bodyguards. Using the element of surprise, at some point either Sichi or Trapani would trap Cuneo in the doorway of the hotel and riddle him with bullets, taking down yet another of the heads of the five families, with only Philip Tattaglia and Emilio Barzini remaining. Aldo would next meet with Rocco Lampone in Brooklyn to plot the assassination of Don Tattaglia, whom they knew was meeting with a hooker in the area at a backroom brothel near the Manhattan Bridge. After locating the Tatalias at the St. Sebastian Hotel, Rocco and Aldo would assault the building and eventually find Philip Tatalia in bed with a hooker and completely unprepared for the attack. Finally, Aldo would meet with Al Neri near the police station in Little Italy and prepare for the final hit and the only one Aldo was likely personally looking forward to, Don Emilio Barzini. Aldo would drive Neri, dressed as an NYPD patrolman, to the Justice Building at Folly Square and Al would proceed to ticket Barzini's vehicle and set himself up for the perfect shot on the Don as he exited the building. Things wouldn't go entirely to plan though, as Al would reportedly miss his initial shots at Don Barzini and be forced to handle the encroaching foot soldiers as the Don tried to make an escape. Aldo was not going to let that happen, however. He would personally chase Barzini down to the courtyard beside the Justice Building and corner him for his ultimate revenge. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it would be you. Aldo would finally avenge his father, Johnny Trapani, by murdering Barzini, and with his death, conclude the elaborate and brutal baptism by fire that Michael had set up for the Corleone's rivals. Soon after Barzini's death, Aldo would return to Michael at the church and silently inform him that his plan had gone effectively exactly as he'd hoped, and that now, the Corleone's stood as the undisputed kings of New York. Not long after this consolidation of power by Michael, Aldo Trapani would meet with Don Corleone and receive yet another well-earned promotion, to official underboss, and therefore second-in-command of the family. For Aldo, however, there was still much to be done. Sometime between Michael's 1955 move to Nevada and 1958, Aldo Trapani would further consolidate the power of the Corleone family in New York by taking control of every racket formerly owned by the now-destroyed five families. In fact, 
Once Michael had completed his move to Las Vegas and established the Corleones there with Mo Green no longer an issue, Aldo would be given complete control of the Corleone interests in New York, and thus be declared the dawn of the Corleone family in the Northeast. With Aldo's ascension, he would crack down on all remaining assets that had been controlled by the five families, and establish himself as both Michael's new right-hand man and the boss of all New York operations. In 1957, with the death of Peter Clemenza of a supposed heart attack, Aldo would become the sole person in charge of Corleone operations in the state of New York, and as a result, he would promote his up-and-coming nephew, Dominic Barbaro, to underboss of the Trapani crime family, and continue showing him the ropes of running a family, as well as endearing Dominic to Michael. In 1958, Aldo would be invited alongside Michael and several other powerful Mafia Dons to attend the birthday party of Hyman Roth in Havana, Cuba, as well as New Year's, and be respected and well-known enough to be granted some of Mr. Roth's assets as he prepared to retire. Or so he said, anyways. Salute! Cheers! Salute! And, at the time of my retirement, I turn over all my interests in the Cuba operation to you, my partners. To the Corleone family and all of Trapani, the Hotel Capri. Grazie. The Nationale will go to Rico Granados, and the Sevilla Biltmore to Samuel Mangano, here with us all the way from Sicily. The rest of you will also share in handling my non-casino operations. Gentlemen, rebels and petty criminals are Cuba's past. We are its future. La Chaim. Gendan, salute. During this celebration, Aldo would express concern regarding the growing threat of rebels in Cuba under Fidel Castro, and be proven right when the New Year's party that night was interrupted by the then president of Cuba resigning publicly. As chaos erupted on the streets of Havana, Aldo, Dominic, Michael, and Fredo would all flee the government building they'd been staying at and attempt to make their way safely to a plane at the airport waiting to get them out of the country. With both Dominic and Aldo defending the group, they would indeed manage to reach the airport, but having no time for an official entrance, Aldo would opt to use a blowtorch in order to cut a hole in the fence surrounding the airfield so that they could reach the plane as quickly as possible. Just as he opened up the path, however, Aldo would step foot onto the airfield and immediately be blinded by military forces guarding the area. Aldo would be shot once, fatally, in the neck, and given the chaotic circumstances, his body would be left by Dominic, Michael, and Fredo as they escaped the rioting of Fidel's rebels. At the age of 33, Aldo Trapani had finally been killed. Wait up, I can get us through here. Aldo! Leave him. We have to go. Aldo Trapani was a terrifyingly ambitious gangster who took to his violent lifestyle with the eagerness of a dog getting to his favorite bone. Having been ushered into the life of a street thug by his gangster father, Aldo was both respectful and fearful of mobsters like Don Corleone, which was only further reinforced when he witnessed his father's violent murder at the hands of Emilio Barzini and his men. Aldo was an active and rambunctious youth from his earliest days, and was known to show an interest in both sports and fighting by age 12 hobbies which would also lend themselves quite naturally to his changing career in his early 20s under Luca Brazzi. Due to his love and loyalty for his father, Aldo would be predisposed to both help and respect the Corleone family his entire life, and when given the chance by Luca, was more than happy to join the family under any circumstances, regardless of how well he was compensated, which for the record, was always quite substantial. He was also no stranger to violence, starting with witnessing the death of his father, and had no qualms about participating in robberies alongside his Bowery Boys gang, even though his family was reportedly doing just fine financially due to his late father's contributions to Don Corleone. 
Aldo was known to exert his own natural talents for violence on numerous occasions as well, gladly taking the opportunity to beat and murder the members of his gang who had ripped him off after a score, and rarely, if ever, reacting to the death he was surrounded by, with anything other than cold indifference. He was also a natural with just about any firearm he could get his hands on, and would develop this skill considerably over the years, to the point of being able to perform surgically perfect shots on targets he was ordered to eliminate, with minimal effort. He was also quite quick to anger, especially in his early days, and would use physical intimidation amongst other violent means to get his way whenever necessary. He could be rude, intense, and even persuasive when necessary, but when dealing with allies or friends could also be understanding and empathetic as long as he wasn't ordered to kill those friends by one of the Corleone bosses. In fact, despite any positive attributes Aldo might have had in his personal life, his loyalty to the Corleones would compel him to perform acts that would otherwise be completely unforgivable, and may still be, such as the murder of his former best friend, Martin Monk Malone, despite Malone's attempts to convince Trapani to let him go free, all because the order for his death had come from on high. Aldo's charming and personable side would be most prominently visible while he was in a relationship with Frankie Malone, and though they would only be together for a few years, her death would also arguably push Aldo towards the callous and indifferent persona he would cling to for most of his life until his death in 1959. Aldo was also much smarter than he may have led on, deferring to the knowledge and orders of his superiors for most of his career, but taking on the role of boss, including the delegation of work, with a natural aptitude, as well as maintaining control of an extortion empire that spanned several boroughs of New York. His ability to use both his brains and his brawn in order to achieve victory likely played a large part in his ascension up the ranks of the Corleone family so rapidly, and his reliability as an enforcer, extortionist, and assassin cemented his position in the family up until his timely death. Between 1945 and his death in 1959, Aldo Trapani was responsible for possibly more murders than any other single individual in the city's history up to that point, on top of numerous other crimes related to his conquest of the city's underworld for the Corleone family. Though the numbers we are about to present you are not 100% accurate, they have been compiled by examining all known incidents involving Trapani over the years, including his ruthless takeover of rackets across New York over a decade in his 20s, and at the very least, should be considered low estimates for just how many crimes the man could have been charged with had he been deprived of the legal protections afforded to him by the Corleone family. That being said, let's take a look at what crimes we do know he committed, starting with Robbery, assault, and murder when participating in a robbery alongside the Bowery Boys sometime in 1945, and subsequently killing all of his former allies when given the opportunity by Luca Brazzi. Racketeering, extortion, bribery, and murder when taking over Emilio's butcher shop in Little Italy by shaking down the owner, as well as killing several rival mobsters guarding the casino racket upstairs for Luca, and bribing police sergeant Joe Galtasino. Assault when attacking the men who had themselves assaulted the Undertaker Bonacera's daughter, alongside Polly Gatto and Monk Malone. Murder when taking revenge on the Tatalia soldiers who murdered Luca Brazzi. Murder and accessory murder when fighting off the men who attempted to assassinate Vito Corleone and threatened the life of Frankie Malone. And assault when attacking a mobster on the Brooklyn Bridge to extract information about the assassination attempt. Murder when helping Peter Clemenza and Rocco Lampone save Tom Hagen from Salazzo's men. Murder when defending Don Vito Corleone from more assassins at a hospital in Little Italy. Murder when killing numerous police officers who break up a party at Rosa's brothel, including Sergeant Joe Galtasino. Bribery when bribing a police chief on orders from Don Vito Corleone. Murder, tampering with evidence, and destruction of government property when destroying Fredo Corleone's car containing a body at a police station in New Jersey. Murder, accessory murder, destruction of private property, terrorism, and evading arrest when bombing a Tatalia family business, The Roost, and later murdering Polly Gatto under orders from Pete Clemenza. Murder, assault, and destruction of private property when infiltrating a Tatalia family warehouse alongside Pete Clemenza and several other Corleone soldiers, as well as bombing the building in order to send a message. Murder, trespassing on private property, and accessory animal abuse when killing several guards on the Jack Waltz estate and helping Rocco Lampone to behead Waltz's horse and place the head in his bed. 
murder, accessory murder, evading authorities, and assault when planting a gun inside of Louis' restaurant for Michael Corleone to kill Captain McCluskey and Virgil Salazzo, as well as helping Michael to escape the police and mobsters chasing them afterwards. Murder when killing the men who ambushed him and Frankie at his midtown apartment, as well as chasing down the attackers to a church in Brooklyn. Murder, accessory murder, and assault when extracting information out of a Tatalia Capo alongside Santino Corleone, murdering him, and attacking Tito Morelli's funeral parlor to find and kill Bruno Tatalia and his men. Assault and possibly murder when breaking up a strike at Verona Warehouse under orders from Don Vito Corleone. Tampering with evidence and evading arrest when moving illicit goods from Pete Clemenza's house to Polly Gatto's former safe house, following a crackdown by the police due to Aldo's handling of Verona Warehouse. Murder, accessory murder, assault, and racketeering when attacking a Cuneo family business, Caruso, alongside Santino Corleone, as well as a Cuneo warehouse controlled by Artie the Moose Manzarano in Hell's Kitchen. Murder and assault when tracking down Santino's murderers and killing them, as well as extracting information out of the tollbooth attendant who played a role in Sonny's death. Murder when killing numerous Barzini family soldiers to supposedly locate an FBI informant, as well as killing even more Cuneo family soldiers and his former best friend, Marty Monk Malone, for betraying the Corleones. Murder when killing several Barzini family soldiers and Salvatore Tessio for attempting to betray and assassinate Michael Corleone. Murder, armed robbery, and assault when robbing a casino controlled by Mo Green, and later personally killing Green as he received a massage at Orchid Inc. in Midtown. Murder and evading authorities when working alongside Pete Clemenza, Willie Cicci, Rocco Lampone, and Al Neri to kill Don Stracci, Don Cuneo, Don Tatalia, and finally, Don Barzini. At least 40 murders when taking assassination contracts from Salvatore Tessio, Pete Clemenza, Al Neri, and The Trojan between 1945 and 1955. Countless murders, racketeering, and terrorism when systematically taking control of every underground racket in New York between 1945 and 1955, as well as bombing the compounds of all four rival families in their respective neighborhoods. And trespassing on private property and murder when killing soldiers to escape the chaos in Havana, Cuba, as well as breaking onto the airfield where he was subsequently killed. As you can see, even with a conservative estimate of Trapani's crimes, he is thought to be responsible for nearly 1,000 murders in New York City alone over the course of roughly 10 years, and nearly 100 counts of racketeering and extortion thanks to his efforts in consolidating Corleone power using extreme violence. Though his life was relatively short in the grand scheme of things, his legacy as one of the most effective, feared, and respected mobsters New York City had ever seen seems to us beyond dispute. What makes a man as violent as Aldo Trapani was? Is it family? Perhaps revenge? Or is it simply something that lies dormant until the day it becomes necessary? Whatever the case, we think it can be safely said that regardless of what motivated them, the gangsters of the Corleone family were among the most ruthless and powerful gangsters America had ever seen. In case this reality had not sunk in for you yet, dear viewer, America is a dangerous place. And as long as the likes of Michael Corleone or Aldo Trapani continue to hold significant influence in cities as big as New York, that seems quite unlikely to change. Stay indoors, people. You never know if that smooth-talking Italian you met at the supermarket last week is secretly running one of the country's most violent criminal organizations. I'll see you next time, folks, for another exciting edition of A Criminal History, where we may just go somewhere far beyond what you may be expecting. I'm your host, Guinness Walker, and thank you so much for watching.